career funnies. This lecture is devoted to a few elaborate joke projects that I and my colleagues at the Freer Gallery of Art conceived and carried out while I was a curator there. The principal one was a complete uh, presentation of the series of 22 pictures with captions that I prepared as a parting gift for Bernard A. Stubbs, a remarkable man who began as a guard at the Freer, and then during his long career there, he took over an amazing diversity of other functions, managing the storage of the artworks, doing the photography, eventually writing one of their scholarly gallery guides. I also talk about and I show the train scroll that an artist named Bill Lewis and I created in Ann Arbor for Max Lehrer's birthday while I was working uh, with Max toward my master's degree in, <clears throat> in Ann Arbor. First image, please. This is a photograph of the Freer staff, along with a few visitors, taken on that occasion in 1956 by Ray Schwartz, the Freer photographer, so he isn't in the picture. I won't try to name everybody in it, although I have a sheet with all their names and signatures, but I'll name a few. I've already done this in another lecture, but I'll do it, do it again anyway. Here we go. Beginning at the far left front, Elizabeth Fitzhugh, uh, who was the uh, John Gettin's assistant in the technical laboratory, the person with folded arms in the front row. Behind her, myself, in front of us, George Kuayama, who was then a fellowship student at the Freer Gallery and later went on to be a curator of East Asian art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Behind him, a tall man, is um, uh, Richard Eddinghausen, curator of Near Eastern art at the Freer. Um, and in front of him is a little boy. To the right of, the right of the little boy is Takashi Sugiura, the Freer mounter of that time. And behind him, Russell Milkey, who was in charge of the Freer's installation and other workers. Just to his right, partly cut off, Harold Philip Stern, curator of Japanese art, later the director of the Freer. And to the right of him, high up, John Gettins, uh, wearing glasses. Um, of the staff women, I'll name only two. Uh, in the front, wearing a patterned dress, looking out at us, is Lenore West. And uh, to the right of her, uh, turned partly away, Bertha Usselton, who's the Freer librarian. Between them, seen between them, is the director, Archibald Wendley. And above him, highest up, up above, is uh, Burns A. Stubbs himself. Well, that's enough to name anyway. Let's go on. Um, Stubbs was retiring after many years uh, as really the central person uh, on the Freer staff. The functions that he performed were so many that everybody asked half-jokingly how we were ever going to get along without him. Here, Arch Wenley is presenting him with some kind of retirement gift. I myself had just recently returned from my long time away from the Freer between my years there on the Hackney Scholarship in 1950 to 51 and my return in the spring of 1956 to finish my dissertation and become a curator there. I remembered Stubbs with fondness and admiration, and I made for a presentation to him on his retirement a series of 26 drawings showing stages and incidents in his many years of service at the Freer. The next, please. Um, the original series was given to Stubbs, who enjoyed them very much. Here we see uh, Arch Wenley presenting them to him, and Mrs. Wenley at the right, all of them uh, looking at the uh, pictures and enjoying them. The originals of the series were, of course, taken away by Stubbs, and I have no idea what became of them. But fortunately, they were copied, and a set of copies was preserved in the Freer's archive. When I visited there some years ago, for the first time in many years, a woman who worked there showed me this series of copies and asked me whether I knew who had drawn them. There was apparently no record with them. I had pretty much forgotten them, but I remembered them as a project of my own and uh, let her know who, 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 that I had done them. So now they've become a part of the Freer's history, and I'm happy to show them here and read the inscriptions on them and talk about them. Products of a period when I was full of confidence in my ability to do anything I set my mind to, whether it was scholarly work, writing verse and poetry, drawing pictures, even composing music. Most of these given up later because I was never really good at drawing or composition. Still, here we go. 
I don't have a prepared text, and I'll just read the captions and talk freely. Okay, here we go. First one. Stubbs Pictures, number one. I'll, I'll read the captions. Master Sergeant Stubbs directs the display of World War I weapons at the National Museum. Well, this was based on uh, a true situation. Stubbs had indeed worked at this War mu World War I museum, which was a smaller building not far from the freer, in the back of the freer, a uh, red stone building, building like the other Smithsonian buildings. And inside were indeed weapons displays and various others, sometimes rather grisly things. And um, Stubbs had worked there as a guard before he came to the freer. So I was imagining Stubbs as directing the display of weapons there. And then, next please, at the freer later, uh, read, it reads, later the knowledge that uh, thus acquired is used in the display of Zhou weapons at the Freer Gallery of Art. So here was Stubbs, now having joined the staff of the Freer and installing the Zhou weapons um, in cases at the Freer. The um, weapons in the case are based on actual weapons, and if I had time I would, haha, <laughs> tell you about the extraordinary uh, what, um, construction of Freer Gallery cases at that time. If you looked at them, they had all they were all glass, and you had no idea how they could be opened. But in fact, they had uh, they had uh, posts going down from the corners, going down into the legs. And if you used a certain kind of crank in the legs, and and they would rise up, as you see here, and you could install things in them. Anyway, they've been given up. They have, nobody does that kind of thing anymore. Um, okay, the next please. Here, number three. Stubbs washes the entire collection of Japanese pottery. Um, well, again, I, I don't remember entirely what is going on here. This is all, some of my memory fails on a number of these. Um, as I've, I've related elsewhere in my Freer metal talk, all the Japanese ceramics that Freer had purchased were originally in boxes, inscribed boxes, many of them. These, for Japanese connoisseurs, gave them much of their value. But the first director of the Freer, John Ellerton Lodge, uh, disliked this Japanese practice of connoisseurship by box inscriptions. So he took all the pots out of their boxes, put the boxes in the basement where they were eventually lost or thrown away, uh, anyway, and, there, and lined them up on shelves, as you see here. Now, I have no idea, uh, I, I can't remember at all why Stubbs was washing the pots, but here he is throwing them into a Jiffy home dishwasher. Okay, next, please. Let's go on. Uh, next, Mr. St Mr. Bundy scolds Mr. Stubbs for using improper language. Mr. Stubbs tells Mr. Bundy where to go. Well, Mr. Bundy was someone who was gone by the time I got there, and I knew him only from memory, and I guess some, somewhere I must have seen a picture of him. Um, at any rate, and I don't know what the incident was, but uh, these are all, I must have based some of these on stories that Stubbs himself told and I'm kind of recreating them from imagination. So he's just a thumb with a hammer and he's saying bad words and being admonished by Mr. Bundy. Okay, and the next, uh, number five, Mr. Stubbs provides Freer Gallery limousine service. Again, I don't remember completely, but he must have had an old car like this and he must have taken people. That's probably the first director of the Freer, uh, John Ellerton Lodge seen in the back seat, and they seem to be driving. I guess it's on a street in Georgetown. There were places in Georgetown at that time that still had sort of rough cobblestone streets like this, and street lamps, like little old street lamps, and buildings that look something like this. So I must have had some basis for this picture. Anyway, it's, uh, but well, it's hardly imagined. Okay, then the next one. Number six, um, Mr. Stubbs exhibits the collection and explains Chinese art to a new arrival at the gallery. And that's, of course, Archibald Winley, newly arrived, and Stubbs is explaining about Chinese paintings to him. Well, something like this probably happened, because Winley came, he had actually come to the Freer to apply for a job as a librarian, and uh, John Ellerton Lodge, who hated art historians, uh, asked him if he knew anything about art, and Winley said nothing at all, and, <laughs> Well, John Ellerton Lodge said, you'll do fine, and hired him. Okay, anyway, so, so goes the story. Um, now, the next, please. Again, one I don't completely 
remember what lies behind it. Mr. Stubbs, with the aid of Bertie, makes muslin cases for screens and other objects in the collection. Well, there was indeed a woman, black woman, who um, uh, did sewing at the fair. I have painted her with her unpleasantly black hair. I'm sorry for that. But uh, she and Stubbs and others did make muslin cases to put around the objects. Again, a st story that I, I can't really expound on, but I only dimly remember. The next, number eight. <clears throat> Mr. Stubbs helps Miss Guest to find her lost glasses. Miss Guest had been the secretary of Freer and had worked for him for many years and was one of the three people Freer had designated as friends of the Freer. The other two were, um, oh, Catherine Rhodes, I think was her name, and, um, you know, what's her name, who wrote the book on Lee Gung Lin. Anyway, um, okay, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, Miss Guest still came around and apparently did lose her glasses and apparently Stubbs did help her find them. Uh, okay, these are all stories I must have learned from Stubbs. Um, okay, next. Mr. Stubbs returning to the gallery after lunch, having indulged in his only serious vice, rum cakes, looking rather tipsy. Well, this is my picture behind Stubbs of the Freer Gallery of Art. It's not, not, not so bad, not so far off. Here beside it, I'll put a picture of the actual Freer uh, entrance, and you see that they do resemble each other. Uh, the trees up above in my picture were actual trees growing on the mall then. And uh, okay, so there it was. Now, the next. Um, number 10, Mr. Stubbs feeds the peacocks in the Freer court. Well, as you know, if you've been to the Freer, it's built as a square with a hollow court in the middle, in which now you see mm, trees, flowering bushes, and so on. Quite lovely. But originally, they had, they had had peacocks in the court to go with the peacock room of, of Whistler, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, in the end, they were much too much trouble. They made loud noises. As you know, peacocks don't have nice voices at all. Not at all beautiful. And... Um, they were just a lot of trouble to, to take care of Messy, and eventually they got rid of them. But it was a good idea if it was carried out for a short time and then abandoned. And here is Freer, excuse me, here is Stubbs feeding the peacocks in the rear court. Next, please. Um, the next one, again, refers to an incident I don't remember, but I must have learned it from Stubbs. Mr. Stubbs works under very trying conditions in his original dark room. He was, among other things, the Freer photographer and made photographs and processed them and so on. So here he is with his red light, presumably down in the dark room, and a very elaborate uh, connection, electrical connection, up to the office. Uh, that may be the director's secretary, somebody pressing him and summoning him up there. Anyway, something behind this, which again, I don't remember entirely. Next, number 11A. This is a special insert, I guess. A remarkable record shattered. Mr. Stubbs discovers a pot which, has, which he had packed, has broken. This must be, again, based on an actual incident, and indeed it's something that one never quite recovers from. Several people I can think of who had this happen to them. Um, pops they, were, they had packed being broken, and it hurt their reputations. Next, 12. Mr. Stubbs photographs the Freer bronzes. Well, those of you who know the history of the Freer and the publication of the first bronze catalog, with Wenley and Pope and others anyway, had wonderful photographs printed by a marvelous old collotype system. And these photographs were made indeed by Burns A. Stubbs. And here I'm imagining him uh, photographing one of the uh, famous Freer bronzes. I'll put the bronze, the real thing, beside it. This is a real bronze. It's in unique. There's none other like it anywhere in the world. It has a top that is a human mask with bottle horns, the body is the body of a serpent that goes down the back and curls around the pot with arms reaching forward, ending in claws, and a purring spout with two gaping dragons around it. A remarkable pot. Anyway, so here you see Burns A. Stubbs saying smile and photographing this famous Freer pot. The next, please. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Stubbs, number 13. Mr. Stubbs protects the Freer Gallery Virgin against time and against those who would banish her to storage. Well, this is also a true incident also. Freer, besides collecting Asian art, and before he collected Asian art, collected oil paintings besides Whistler, uh, not so much oil paintings as uh, prints and drawings, but anyway, collected oil paintings by several American artists who are not so much, um, what, valued today, doing, Thayer, Tryon. I don't know who, who painted this, and I can't remember, but one of the really famous paintings uh, in, the, in one of the pa American painting galleries is this one called The Virgin. And uh, they were indeed, somebody wanted to take it down, put it in storage, and Stubbs uh, resisted. Okay, and I have a footnote, and the footnote down below says, perhaps not the virgin, or apologies to any possible exceptions. In other words, I was saying if there's another virgin in the Freer Gallery, this is not the virgin. Okay, it's a little joke. And here is the painting itself beside it, a, an oil painting. Um, these were, as I say, artists that Freer was very fond of, but they didn't turn out to be great masters, as he must have hoped. Okay, next. Number 14. The sales desk diffuses knowledge. Uh, okay, that picture of the Freer sales desk, by the way, is fairly accurate again. The doors and the p patterns over them, the pattern over the uh, desk itself, um, the man there doing addition, getting it all wrong, the display thing there that uh, shows Freer publications, and over on the left, a serviceman of some kind sitting in a chair. Well, that was common. People of that kind would come in off the mall and simply sit there for quiet. Anyway, this sales desk person has sent two people down below to, uh, to Stubbs, and one of them is saying, the gentleman upstairs said you could show us the peacock room in storage. And Stubbs is clutching his forehead and despairing. Anyway, okay, next. Uh, number 15, Mr. Stubbs puts objects of the collection into war storage. Um, I don't know the story behind this, but there must have been some kind of storage to keep things safe during the Second World War. And um, Stubbs must have put them, not, not in garbage cans probably, in some kind of safety. Okay, the next. Okay, here is number 16, uh, Occupational Hazard. Mr. Stubbs exhibits the Tsofule scroll shortly after it was remounted by Mr. Kinoshta. Now, Kinoshta was the Freer mounter before uh, I arrived, actually, before Sugiura. I never met him. He had gone back to Japan by the time I came there as a student. But he apparently worked on too long, longer than he should have, and made some mistakes that were difficult to correct. I tell the story somewhere about how he mounted badly a hanging scroll ascribed to Xiaogui, so that Sugiura had real trouble remounting it. He'd used a paste that was too heavy and, oh, I don't know, used a dark backing paper and so on. Here, uh, Kinoshta has mounted the um, uh, Tsofu Lei scroll, and I'll put beside it the actual scroll. This is a famous, or above it, whatever, of a famous Yuan Dynasty painting, uh, the only work of the artist, I think, and uh, a marvelous picture of a blossoming plum tree with a long, long branch. And as you roll the scroll from right to left, as always, you come to this wonderful long stroke of the upturned branch with a few little things at the end and uh, little uh, blossoms along the way. A uh, superb scroll and a wonderful use of the hand scroll form. Anyway, the point was that, Su that Kinoshita in his late years had used a paste that smelled very bad. And so here is... Uh, Stubbs mounting, putting the scroll in, in, uh, on exhibition. That's probably John Ellerton Lodge over on the left, looking a bit disapproving, and Stubbs holding his nose from the bad smell. Okay, onward. Next, number 17. Mr. Stubbs writes the catalog of Whistler prints and drawings. Well, Stubbs, in addition to everything else, did indeed do scholarly writing, and he had started out as a guard. He had no formal education of any kind. He's simply a self-made man who <laughs> made himself in so many directions that he could do just anything he wanted to. And as far as I know, the Freer Gallery still sells his pamphlets uh, with the uh, catalog of the Whistler Prints and Drawings and another on the Peacock Room. He wrote both of them. Remarkable. 
So at any rate, uh, this one again is of course full of funny allusions. It's based on Whistler's mother. The, the Whistler mother picture is hanging on the wall there. And then you see Stubbs down below dressed as Whistler's mother uh, writing. And what he's writing is the Peacock Room text. Well, anyway, jokes and jokes. Down in the lower left corner is the butterfly, which was Whistler's uh, signature. He used it in uh, just as uh, Japanese and Chinese artists sometimes put seals on their paintings. Whistler admired this practice and imitated it with his butterfly. Um, now, the uh, actual peacock room, I may as well take uh, a bit of time to tell briefly the story of that, the story that Stubbs has in his, his booklet on it. <clears throat> a man named Leyland, who was living in London, uh, had a very, had built a very beautiful house and kept one room uh, which was going to be very special in which he was going to show off his collection of blue and white porcelains. Well, he hired a brilliant young designer. His name was Jekyll. Very, very remarkable. I mean, I can Jekyll and Hyde. Too many remarkable uh, literary-like things in this story. And, uh, and, uh, hired this young man to design the room uh, for the display of his porcel uh, blue and whites. And Jekyll lined the walls of the room with a polychrome leather with an embossed design of pomegranates that had been brought over by Catherine of Aragon with her as part of her trousseau from Spain. And then he built in uh, hand-carved walnut shelving, hand-rubbed, very beautiful, uh, stained, I guess, and rubbed uh, walnut shelving. And then Leyland, the owner of the house, hung a painting by Whistler called The Princess from the Land of Porcelain uh, at the end of the room, over the fireplace, as you see here. And he invited Whistler in to see it and asked him, what do you think of my, my room? Now, Whistler said, you know, lovely, but I w uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to touch up the area around my painting because it doesn't go very well with the painting. It was a bad setting for his painting, he felt. All this uh, polychrome leather and stuff, I guess. So Leyland uh, gave him permission to do this, and then Leyland went away for a month and was gone. And Whistler and an assistant shut themselves up in the room for that month and painted over the whole thing, painted over all the leather with this uh, rich green color, uh, gilded all the walnut shelving, uh, completely obliterating the work that uh, the, the young Jekyll had done, completely re-changing re re the whole look of the room, and painting huge peacocks, as you see, on the uh, tall doors le leading out, out from the room. Um, then, so let me put on the next, uh, the next picture. Here's the other end of the room. So then Leyland returns, and he's obviously very shocked by what he sees and angry. And he asks Whistler how much he wanted for ruining his room. Whistler says, a thousand guineas. And Leyland says, so I'll pay you a thousand pounds. The story is different in other versions. It may have been different amounts. But at any rate, the point is that you paid an artist in guineas and you paid a tradesman in pounds. So um, uh, it was insulting Whistler. And Whistler had still not painted this big area over this desk at the opposite end of the room. And he used it to paint a picture of two peacocks representing himself and Leyland. The rich peacock with its claws clutching golden guineas and looking, spreading its wings and a tail and looking very, very gaudy and self, self-important. And the poor peacock with the tail dragging but still somehow proud, turning around. That's that's Whistler himself. Um, okay, and then the story ends. This young designer Jekyll, who had looked to this project to establish his reputation. <laughs> went mad uh, and was found gilding the floor of his room, muttering about peacocks and pomegranates, and was taken off to the insane asylum and never recovered. Well, the whole story, as I've said elsewhere, is so much like a Max Beerbohm story, you really don't believe it, but it's believable. It really happened that way. Quite remarkable. Anyway, Freer bought the uh, Whistler painting first, The Princess from the Land of Porcelain, and then he eventually bought the whole room, installed it in his Detroit house, and later installed it in the Freer Gallery, uh, where it is to this day. 
I should point out, by the way, if you, yes, here, on the, um, at the, down to the right of the two peacocks, a door leading out from the room. Well, nobody ever goes in there anymore, but that leads to a little tiny office where, unfortunately, the late William Ecker, who was famous for his translations of Li Dai Ming Hua Ji and so on, he worked for a time at the Freer, but he was a very person of an unfortunate personal life. He, he had a wife who I think died of drinking. What happened? He had tragedies anyway. And he himself was badly alcoholic. And um, Archibald Wendley, although very good in any ways, in many ways, was not tolerant of other people's weaknesses. And he put poor Acker in this tiny little office off the Peacock Room where he didn't have very good access to the library. And he would, anyway, it was, it was an awful thing to do. And Acker quit before long. I met Acker in his late years. That's another whole story. Okay. Uh, now then, let's go on. Going on with the uh, uh, Stubbs retirement pictures. Number 18, Mr. Stubbs helps Mr. Kinoshita to pack for his departure to Japan. Well, this has happened before my time. I've done, done from imagination. I must have done Kinoshita from a photograph or something. At any rate, the Freer Mounter Studio is like this, really. It has tatami floors. It has a sink and so on off on one side. So, okay, you imagined. Next, uh, well, number 19. Mr. Stubbs at rest on a typically idle day at the gallery. Okay, this is Stubbs, well, regarded as like a Hindu deity, three-faced and, and seven arms, whatever. One of them, and he's doing such things as hanging the scroll paintings on the left, photographing a pot, um, writing the Whistler catalog with one hand, uh, packing with another, cleaning off things. Anyway, do, doing everything. Everything, all, all his jobs all at once. Okay, next. Here is uh, number 20. Mr. Stubbs views the objects exhibited for approval by the uh, Fine Arts Commission. Every year, the Fine Arts Commission of the Smithsonian, a bunch of high-level people, had to approve the purchases of the Freer before the Freer could go ahead with them. And Stubbs was always, uh, well, very, he was very worried about the extremely high prices that were being paid. He'd been there long enough to see the prices rise. So here are these things and with big prices attached to them, and Stubbs putting his hand against his face and saying, good grief. Okay, the next, please. Now, okay, yes, this is number 21. Um, Mr. Stubbs report to the director that the Marines have developed a mysterious interest in Tibetan sculpture. So here's a group of Marines gathered around uh, one of the Freer cases. And you see, again, these, these cases that have no, complete nothing but glass up above. So, nope, everybody wonders how you could possibly get things in, in and out of them. Uh, at any rate, here they are gathered around this one. You can't see what's inside. And down below, here is uh, Stubbs reporting to Wenli uh, that these Marines have developed this extraordinary interest in Tibetan sculpture. Well, here's the piece I'll put beside it. This is the actual piece in question. Well, as you can see, it's a, I think it's Nepalese. It's a Yabyum, uh, male, female deities, and they are engaged in sex. And if you look underneath, you can see their uh, sex organs joined. And this is what was uh, what the Marines were finding amusing or titillating or whatever. Okay, the next, please. Number 22. The annual caravan bringing objects to the Regent's show. This is something that really took place. Um, as I related in my Freer Metal talk, um, the Freer had to show objects they were considering for purchase to the Fine Arts Commission. And, the, and that met every year in the big Smithsonian building. At the same time, the Freer was forbidden to take anything out of the gallery that it was being that it was buying. So they got around these conflicting uh, requirements by carrying them through a heating duct tunnel uh, that connected the Freer with the main Smithsonian building. So people would go down there carrying objects and we would make our way through this tunnel and come up within the main Smithsonian building, show the objects to the Fine Arts Commission, carry them back. Well, I've added a few things here, a skeleton and tree roots and so on, but basically it was like this. Very, very strange old custom. Next, uh, number 23. Mr. Stubbs promotes sales of publications. Ha <laughs> ha, this is poor John Pope. Uh, Pope had uh, done a book of uh, 
blue and white porcelains in the Tope Kapi Sarai in Istanbul and uh, blue and white by J.A. Pope. Remainder sale, special price, 50 cents. Well, it wasn't that little, but anyway, Stubbs must have somehow been involved in marking down the value of this book. And here is John Pope looking very, very uh, unhappy. Here, by the way, is a picture which I've shown in other connections with John Pope at the far right. This is what he looked like. Somehow he wasn't there when that big staff photograph was made. He was the vice director of the fair when I first went there and later became the director. And I served as curator under him for a time. And okay, next. Next, um, number 24. Mr. Stubbs, confronted with modern scientific techniques for dealing with art objects, delivers his comment. And here he is, back turned to us, arms, uh, hands on his hips, saying, Hmph. That's his comment about the new uh, Freer Laboratory. Uh, as I've also related elsewhere, John Gettens, who had been at the Fogg Museum in Cambridge, uh, came to the Freer Gallery and a, a lab a laboratory was built for him. And this is it. Fairly accurate picture, apparently. Tom Chase, who was Gettens' successor, apparently, Oh, he had a copy of this picture and was trying to find out who had painted it, who had drawn it. Well, it was me. And again, it's more, oh, more detailed and whatever right than I would do now. Uh, somehow I was able to do things then that I wouldn't think of doing now. Full of little jokes, but there we are again. Okay, next. Final picture, number 25. Actually, there's 26 of them because of an 11A, but anyway. Okay, 1956, air conditioning is installed at the Freer Gallery. Mr. Stubbs, who hates the cold, announces his retirement. Well, poor Stubbs, it was true. Um, uh, the old era was over. Uh, this, uh, all this work on build, installing the air conditioning was going on around where Stubbs tried to work. The noise and the mess and everything were just getting him down. So it was a good time for him to retire after many years. And uh, it was great distinction. All right then, so much for the Stubbs retirement pictures. Now I'll show a few other old Freer funnies, as I call them, before going on to another larger project. Okay, the next please, here we go. Now, nobody will remember now, and I can't even find it on the web by Googling, but at that time there were a series of advertisements being published in magazines and the newspaper for, uh, for uh, Valentine's beer or Valentine's ale. And they, they had a, uh, a logo, whatever, the three rings, a triple ring. And you would hold up your hand with three fingers extended, and that was supposed to be it. Well, the, I, I wish I could find some actual ads to put beside these, just to show what these were supposed to be parodying. But I couldn't find any of them. But believe me, they took this form. They were uh, verses with four pictures, and uh, the second and fourth verses had a uh, couple co 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 couplets had to end in Valentine and so on. And they were about particular people. So I made parodies of them and we'll read those as, uh, well, Freer funnies. Gautama Buddha was an Indian gent who went to seek enlightenment. Here he is leaving the palace, a familiar scene in Buddhist art where his concubines are leaning out the window and begging him to come back. He's a young Indian prince. And he goes off to become eventually the Buddha and become the enlightened being and the one who founds traditional Buddhism. Second scene. Under the Bodhi, he sat trying to get his mind off Valentine. The Bodhi tree was the tree under which Buddha achieved enlightenment finally. And here he is making the three ring sign and dreaming about a cup of Valentines. Third. At last he cried, I found the way to save all men from karma's sway. And finally, just make that mudra, the three ring sign, and ask the man for Valentine. A mudra is, of course, a Buddhist hand gesture representing things like meditation or teaching. But here he's doing the three ring Valentine sign, and here it shows Stupa as the guy handing him a big thing of Valentine's beer. Okay, enough of that one. Next, please. Um, Confucius was a Chinese sage. He lived to an advanced old age. Human conduct he'd refine by ritual and Valentine. One of the one old sage giving a smug of Valentine to another. Down next one. His writings as they stand today are mostly forged, so scholars say. And there they are, the three best known 
writings attributed to Confucius, the Lun Yu, the Daoshui, the Zhongyong, and so on, and behind uh, Confucian maxim. And then finally, but men still quote his greatest line, Confucius say, by Ballantine. And here you see Confucius presumably making the sign and somebody bringing a, bearer, a thing of beer to him in a, in a traditional Chinese landscape with a waterfall, etc. Oh, how I did these things, I can't imagine. Okay, the next, please. Yes. Oh, these are really pretty sacrilegious. Okay, here we go. Jesus Christ was rather odd. He claimed to be the Son of God. He changed the water into wine. He should have made it Ballantine. They crucified him, but, to said, he rose to heaven from the dead. And there he quaffs that drink divine, that heavenly nectar, Ballantine. Well, lots of rather sick jokes, I'm afraid. Okay, I hope I don't offend anybody with that one. Now, onward. Uh, <laughs> uh, St. Anthony, while meditating, was tempted by the lures of Satan. This is uh, inspired by that wonderful painting of St. Anthony meditating in the wilderness in the Frick Gallery, a Frick house in, in, in New York, uh, in their living room. Great painting, anyway. Okay, I can't remember. Some early Italian artist painted it. St. Anthony, while meditating, was tempted by the lures of Satan. He offered women food and wine, but not a drop of Ballantine. Here is uh, St. Anthony being surrounded by nude women and creatures and everything. They were offering him all kinds of things, but not Ballantine. Then, next. Now, if the devil had been smart, he would have won out at the start. Here's the devil sending away all the lures and St. Anthony in his cave. And the last uh, picture. For what man could resist a stein of cool and foaming Ballantine? The two of them sitting, enjoying Ballantine's beer and God up above looking rather angry about it all. Oh, real, real sac sacrilege. Then, next. <laughs> this is, uh, we have to remember, this is 1956. Adolf Hitler rose to power during Deutschland's darkest hour. They brought him Hofbrau. He cried, Nein, ich trinke nur das Ballantine. We haven't any? Then use force. Conquer the world. Control the source. Yeah, here's a map with Ballantine's beer going across the uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, anyway, and then the marching Nazis. That's why his armies cross the Rhine, to bring him stocks of Ballantine. And they're marching as they make the three ring sign and so on. Okay, enough of that. Now, last of all, uh, A.G. Wenley at the Freer, at old inscriptions, had has no peer. On the Brundage bronze, he saw a sign, archaic script for Ballantine. Well, there's a Yashing, the Chang Dynasty thing in which the inscriptions sometimes appear um, with a Ballantine three ring sign in it. Oh, I actually drew the three rings so that they go, oh no, I was, I was so intricate at that time. Okay. Uh, he cried, the men of early Joe were evidently in the know. Um, there they are with, with bronzes, real bronzes around them. These are all based on real bronzes. That's why they made their bronzes fine to fill them up with Ballantine. Yeah, okay, enough for that one. Oh, my goodness. How these things went on and on and on. Um, now, here, there's another one. Next, there's the upper and lower parts of a poem. This is an old manuscript that was found, again, in the Freer archive. Nobody knew what it was until I told them. But what it was, was, is, uh, this is not by me, but by John Pope. And it's a poem that he made up to ridicule um, George Rowley. George Rowley, who taught Chinese art history at Princeton, had written a book titled Principles of Chinese Painting based on translations that had been made by others. Rowley couldn't read Chinese. And John Pope, who had written his famous Sinology or Art History question mark article, uh, ridiculing scholars such as Rowley and Bachhofer, who uh, worked on Chinese art without being able to read the language. Pope was one of the people who believed that Sinology was the answer to everything. If you'd read the text, you could study anything. Chinese history, geography, agriculture, art, uh, just by being able to read the text. Okay. Anyway, uh, Rowley had used an unfortunate 
phrase somewhere, uh, coming to grips with the chi. Chi was you know, the spirit, kind of loosely used uh, word at that time. And uh, somehow he had gotten the idea that uh, the, the, this mystical chi was the key to whatever, and talked about get it, coming to grips with the chi. Well, John Pope made up this verse to make fun of Rowley and in this line. And as you see, it starts out, Oh, the Chinese can paint, though their ways, their works may seem quaint to those unaccustomed to see, with the eyes of a sage whose quiet old age has been deeply enriched by the chi, and so on, down through. I won't read it all. But, uh, but what was this chi, this wonderful chi? How could I find it? Where could it be? And so on. Um, so he writes this verse, each of the things ending, uh, about finding the chi, and then down at the bottom, um, in despair and at last, I resorted to fast in the hope that a vision I'd see that might give me a clue about what to do to come face to face with the tree. Then the final stanza, so Eureka, I found it, this marvelous tree. It's not in the painting at all, it's in me. I'm so happy and gay that I'm singing, hey, hey, I've at last come to grips with the tree. Okay, that was John Pope's uh, verse, ridiculing Bachhofer, um, excuse me, ridiculing Rowley, or, or a line that Rowley had written. So during the few days after John Pope composed this, next please, composed this verse and gave us all copies of it, I took the trouble to compose a translation of it into rhyming Chinese. I got the rhymes from Ueda's Japanese Dictionary, as I remember, and then with others present, I presented this to John Pope charging him with having stolen this verse from the ancient Chinese writer and claiming it as his own. Well, there we are. Such was a typical freer elaborate joke or scholarly prank. All these were just done for passing amusement, as I say. No thought of saving them for posterity. But somebody presented me with these, again asking me about who had composed them, so here I am telling the story. All right, now, that's all I have to show you of proper Freer Funnies. But I want to put in here, uh, to end with, a similar project. This one carried out a few years earlier, before my return to the Freer, in 1952, when I was still in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, at the University of Michigan, working toward my MA exam, my master's degree exams. Okay, now, this, here we go. Let's have the first, this is the title and the first section of a remarkable scroll, whom we will, which we will call the train scroll. Um, and uh, let me put somewhere beside it, or to, yeah, whatever, just for the time being, this photo, um, uh, the, this uh, elaborate prank, um, another elaborate production uh, known as the train scroll was made largely under my direction uh, mainly by myself and the Ann Arbor artist Bill Lewis. And here's a picture of Bill. This is a recent photo of him, still healthy and working at the age of 92, uh, planning still another exhibition. Well, when we did the train scroll together, he was still an active artist in the practice of art department at the University of Michigan, specializing in paintings of machinery, industrial scenes, ships, and trains. And he had his studio in a loft up above the Potter's Guild, which was just a bit off State Street then in Ann Arbor, um, where my wife Dorothy spent a lot of her time potting. She became a very serious, uh, dedicated potter. And her close friend was the guild president, Eppie Lewis, Bill's wife. And the four of us became friends. So, recognizing Bill's skill in painting trains, I conceived a plan for him, with my collaboration, to produce a Chinese-like scroll in which a freight train is seen winding its way through a traditional Chinese landscape. I lent him a copy of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual of Painting, which showed how to paint landscapes in the traditional styles. I gave him a brush and ink and an inkstone and a roll of good painting paper that I had bought in Korea, and I gave him some advice and I turned him loose. And the outcome, which he finished shortly afterwards, was the now famous train scroll. Okay, now, Put it put on uh, uh, replacing Bill uh, this this photograph. I should say before going on that my younger colleague J.P. Park, 
who took his PhD at University of Michigan and is now teaching at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, wrote me several years ago that he meant to write a scholarly article about this scroll. The this, this, this scroll is kept at the University of Michigan. I presented it to them some years ago after receiving it from Irmgard Lur, who had survived her husband Max. Max had uh, left it and she gave it to me and I gave it to the, to the uh, department at Michigan to keep it. At any rate, um, when I got this email from this person, J.P. Park, I had never heard of, about writing a serious thing about the train scroll, I thought it was all a joke, but it wasn't. He's very really serious. And since then, I've got to know him pretty well. Met him for the first time in person just last week at a meeting in Honolulu, anyway. And um, he's written an article that's going to uh, appear in a forthcoming issue of Orientations magazine which I, I refer you all to that, and I hope you'll find this and read it. Uh, I don't want to scoop him in any way, but I do want to show images of the scroll in this video lecture and talk about it from my own memory of it. His article begins this way. This is J.P. Park writing about the scroll. Now let's put just the scroll on the screen, and also, yeah, here we go, and pictures of Max Lur, because the, the painting was done for him. It was done as a birthday present for Max Lur. Okay, here we go. This is J.P. Park writing. Imagine this. One day in early winter of 1952, a group of scholars gather at an unknown location in a center for humanistic studies in the North American Midwest. The town, Ann Arbor, was a modest college town known for its urban forest, a vibrant intellectual community, and college football, and its great public university. The gathering was organized by a graduate student named Jim, who had become one of the century's most prominent scholars of Chinese art. The meeting had been called to commemorate and celebrate the upcoming birthday of his, of his advisor, Max Lur, 1903 to 1988. It was a sort of surprise party at which a special gift collaborated on by various people within East Asian studies circles at the University of Michigan would be presented. Together, these scholars had made a humorous, creative, and unique landscape painting in the traditional Chinese style. Unfortunately, the scroll was soon forgotten and only after half a century has it resurfaced. The painting may seem to be a practical joke among friends, but it is also a highly informed and keenly produced improvisation on what we immediately recognize as Chinese painting. While narrating how this scroll painting came to be, this paper will also think through a number of the effects in the work's composition, styles, subject matters, and colophones especially in the context of today's completely globalized Chinese art history in the postmodern academy, end quotation. Wow, little did we suspect that our creation would ever evoke such impressive writing as that. Anyway, so I'll go on now, here we go. But while I put on some pictures of Max Lur. Um, it was done for his birthday, uh, 1952, so anyway, and he, um, um, so all the people who were involved in making the scroll were gathered together, and he came completely completely unaware and was presented with this and had to, well, open the wrapper and look at the painting and unroll the painting and read everything and as a connoisseur would read an actual scroll. Max Lur, in other words, had to improvise his part in this elaborate joke, and he did it magnificently. He was, if anything, Lur's performance was better than ours. It was an amazing occasion. I wish there had been somebody there to record it in, uh, wow, the movie camera and a record. Oh, no, that's, that's long gone. At any rate, let me just go on and uh, show the various parts of the scroll and what Max was, uh, was um, uh, confronted with, so to speak. And you have to imagine Max sitting there and unwrapping it. It had a rather traditional looking uh, wrapper with a string and everything on it. But then when next please, when you opened it, next and next please, you saw a zipper inside. Well, um, a, a Bill seems to remember that when he saw this, Max looked at it and said, ah, early song, or something like that. Very, he, he kept a very serious scholarly demeanor all the way through, and it was, it was a marvelous performance. Okay, then inside, here is this uh, label on the scroll saying, Louis, Louis is a uh, name I gave Bill Lewis, Louis, Louis, uh, the H, uh, Wu Jin, the uh, freight train without end, 
Their scroll paintings, uh, landscape scroll paintings, are often called Qishan Wujin, or Streams and Mountains Without End. So this is the freight train without end scroll. The next uh, picture, uh, here you see the whole thing. Tujuan, Junji, genuine work. All looking very, very uh, properly, whatever, t traditional. The next. Okay, then the, the beginning of the scroll, which we have now seen, first of all, there's a um, the title written in big characters saying the H uh, Tujuan, the the freight train, or the train scroll, uh, Dungan Daoran, that's myself. Dungan, I lived on East An Street, so Dungan meant East An. And I did all the seals using different red pencils to copy famous collector seals from old paintings. Boy, it was a lot of work. And here is the beginning of the scroll with the same title uh, written in seal script and with more seals. And then the painting begins, and here you see a scholar an old Chinese scholar in his house, and trees and rocks and so on in a good Chinese style. And um, uh, and here's uh, a another old guy with a staff standing by a uh, by some kind of crossing. And here comes the train, the, the, uh, the um, locomotive. Well, I'm sorry I don't have many details, but it's, uh, it's, you, you can see it up close anyway. And then the, the uh, coal car and the other cars. So here, the, here begins the actual scroll. And then as we roll on next, uh, you see it disappearing or move going back into the... See, the, the train runs through the entire scroll. It disappears behind a tree and off into the distance, sort of loosely based on a passage in a Shagui scroll where... You go way off into the distance and then come into the foreground again. Okay, it goes through uh, a town, I think it's there, and trees, and then comes in, into the foreground again and disappears into a mountain. And down here in the foreground, you see trees and two, uh, two birds, uh, uh, and then a old scholar and his servant in a boat, and reeds and so forth. Next. Then next section... Um, you see the, uh, well, not a trestle, but a kind of bridge going across a ravine between two mountains, and the train uh, is going over it. And in a little bit further toward us, you, uh, we see the old scholar who leans against the pine tree or the rock, as always, on the ledge, gazing at what should be the void, except instead of a void, here is this bridge with the freight train going rattling over it, over the waterfall. And then a little bit below him, the little boy servant, who usually is seen bringing a chin or a Chinese zither. But here he's carrying, if you look closely, I wish I had the tails. Uh, if you look closely, it's a uh, ben not banjo, a guitar. Because Max Lure played the guitar. It was, his, it was his musical instrument. Not particularly well, but he played it anyway. So the, the, the scroll is full of allusions of that kind. Then it, uh, the, the train goes into another mountain and winds around through the mountain in and out of tunnels and then appears down below. This is a mountain, by the way, in the Mi style, the Mi dots, Mi Oran, Mi Fu. Uh, and down below, again, I wish I had a detail, you see a potter's uh, studio built uh, against the side of the hill with a climbing kiln and lots of pots and so on. Well, that, of course, is an allusion to the potter's guild. And then you see this train going across the another bridge and past behind trains and so on. And you come to here, the next section. Okay, let me let me uh, stop here and 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 show you just a minute and read. Yes, here, here's an, here it is. The uh, inscription written up in the sky. Now this is in the hand of the Chenlong Emperor who writes these doggerel inscriptions in the sky or in whatever blank space you can find uh, on paintings. And so I made up a rhyming quatrain, again in good rhymes, um, and inscribed it here in the Chenlong Emperor's uh, hand, writing his, sign his signature at the end, UT, imperially inscribed, with Chenlong seals in different colors again. And the inscription, which I, I won't try to read it in Chinese, says the, the, uh, the train loaded with uh, commercial goods flies like the dragon. The, the locomotive is the head of it, and the freight cars are the uh, follow. Uh, 
morning till night, uh, flying like the wind. It doesn't, unable to stop, something like that. Uh, some, in some city, the merchants are awaiting the contents. And it's all in good rhyming. Uh, it's good, it really rhymes. Uh, I went to the trouble of doing that, okay. Then, okay, here we go. Then the train goes behind another hill uh, in this next section, and um, a little pavilion or kia, whatever, rest thing down here. This is, of course, in the style of Needs On, another Chinese artist. The, cha the scroll changes in landscape styles as you go. Uh, it's full of these allusions of this kind. And the, uh, the, the cars, dozens of them, uh, very nicely drawn, by the way, it's quite, quite wonderful. Um, uh, uh, appearing out of the distance in the needs on landscape and coming into the foreground. Okay, here next. Now, as, as it comes into the foreground, where there's a flat car, there's a coal car or something like that, and then three box cars, and one of them, you can't see it here, but it has written on it, Sushiran Bama. Uh, 40 men and 8 horses. Well, that's a kind of obscure allusion to back in the First World War, the cars, boxcars used in France had written on them something that meant 40 men and 8 horses. And uh, they were called the 40 and 8 cars. Well, that, as I say, is an obscure allusion. But anyway, here, uh, the little boy riding the buffalo in many Song Dynasty paintings, here is being thrown off the buffalo as the buffalo scurries away, frightened by the noise of this train. And then as we come to the end here, uh, yes, here, you see the, after these boxcars, here is the great Buddha of Kamakura being carried on a flat car over the, um, over the stream. And then there's a, uh, here's, and here's a detail. Then there's a car with, uh, oh, well, anyway, Chinese uh, uh, lofty gentleman in it, looking sort of like a traditional pavilion. And then finally the, uh, the caboose with someone uh, running the caboose. Okay, that is the end of the scroll as such. Then I have a signature at the end here. Shangjiang uh, Kuisa. Shangjiang means uh, uh, merchants, gov merchants government, something like that. Well, that was an allusion to the Chi uh, the Chinese emperors who would give their reigns titles, and this is a reign title. Eisenhower had just come become the president. And Eisenhower's uh, administration was sometimes called government by businessmen, somewhat disparagingly. So I call I use that term government by businessmen, Shangjiang, as a as my reign title. And then um, Tao Shangjai above the pottery studio, meaning his studio was built above the potter's guild. Louis uh, his name for uh, Lo Yue, Shenzhong, for um, Lur, done for Professor Lur. She painted this, and then I made seals for him. Well, this is full of, I say, elaborate little jokes. And then after that, not it still doesn't end. Uh, after the uh, scroll, the painting proper ends. It's a whole series of colophones by me and others. I won't do them in, in great length, but just uh, just a few of them. The first one is in the in the uh, calligraphy and uh, manner of the Hui, Emperor Huizhong, uh early 12th century who was the great collector, and uh, he says, Shen he, my, uh, him, himself, UT, imperial inscribed, and places it in the machinery class, uh, for top uh, divine, divine class, the, no, machinery category, divine class. He had categories within which you would place the paintings, and then they could be uh, either capable or marvelous or divine, Sun Pin. And he signs it with his cipher and seals and so on. It's just, uh, these are all copied from actual seals on old Chinese paintings. And then the next one is by Mi Fu, who the, the famous calligrapher, connoisseur, whatever, uh, some, some minor painter, but major calligrapher. Um, Mi Fu, anyway. And uh, in his calligraphy, supposed to be, and he is criticizing the emperor's uh, inscription uh, saying, woohoo, alas, woohoo, Tao Shang Jai, uh, uh, Mr. Above the Pottery st uh, Studio run, uh, give back our mountains and rivers, Huan Wu Shan Shui, uh, Zaim, alas. Uh, the Jin Shang, the present emperor, although he says Shun Pin, divine class, uh, 
and uh, is very happy about it. Yuan Zhang, that's myself, uh, I say, and then I have a four-character phrase which I got from Mifu's writings, which means something like, I would fall down laughing. It makes me fall down laughing, uh, a put-down of something he sees. Okay, enough of that. Now let's, let's just go on quickly and finish this up. Then one which is under my own name, Zhao Zhou is, is um, California, and Keihiru is a name I was given by a Japanese because it's a phonetic thing for Keihiru. It doesn't make any sense in Chinese. But Qingbei Fei Lu, which doesn't make any sense. Keiru, uh, this is under my own name. And I use the uh, Shangzhong reign title and so on. And I give the story of Lewis, uh, Bill Lewis, and how he had his um, uh, studio up above the Potter's Guild and how his wife, Epi, etc. And I, all in the best Chinese I could manage, on and on and on. I won't even try to read it. I can't even read my own writing anymore. And then there's another one which goes under the name of, let's see, I think I have it signed by, yes, Wang Fang Gong in Beijing, a famous later scholar. And uh, he uh, uses all kinds of comical things about the Huacha, apparently, means uh, the fire chariot. And it was used for a chariot that carried the sinners around in hell. And I, I tried to drag out all kinds of learned allusions to put in the, to, into this inscription. Anyway, and um, ending with that one. And then various other people added inscriptions and, and colophones. People at the university, I can't identify them all anymore. Uh, uh, Jim Plummer was there, James Plummer. And um, the one of them, next please. Uh, now here's one in Japanese style, written very good Japanese style. That was by Kyoko Kornhauser. David Kornhauser taught uh, Asian geography at the University of Michigan then. And his Japanese wife, Kyoko, later killed in a car crash, tragically, um, she wrote this very lovely uh, poem in, in, uh, in Japanese calligraphy. And finally, the last inscription, written in very neat Chinese script of the kind you use presenting a memorial to the emperor, was written by James Crump, Professor James Crump, or Jim Crump. And he had somewhere learned uh, how to write uh, this kind of script, but also how to compose a, uh, a memorial to the emperor. And he takes up this elaborate joke about the, uh, how the emperor approves uh, the, the scroll and, and how all the common people are going to be uh, turned away from their natural and their proper uh, occupations of, of agriculture and so on, and they're all going to be taken, taken to making... Uh, trying to make uh, watch uh, or st sh steam or fire chariots, etc. Elaborate, elaborate joke. And everybody, in other words, came in and helped with this uh, great project. And here is Max Lur having to read and, uh, and appreciate it all, which he did, as I say, magnificently. Now, okay, enough, enough, enough. I could, uh, I end with a photograph of my two here. This one, my two grandchildren. I put this on just to remind me. When, when they heard about, well, this and the opera, which I'll talk about in another sort of thing and so on, they had this question, but yes, wonderful, funny, but why did they do this? Why did they spend so much time and talent and effort and everything? And um, this, I, I really don't have any. These are the daughters of my son, Nicholas, and his wife, Kay. Great, uh, uh, two of their five uh, daughters. And they're twins, Abigail and Maggie. Um, anyway, they were, they asked why why do they do things like this? I don't any I don't have any good answer to that. I can only do something like Sir Edward Hillary or what was his name about why he conquered Everest because it was there. I mean, we did it because it was fun, because we could, because we had the ability, uh, and so on. Well, I could go on with other things. I made for Max at one point an armchair archaeologist kit for another of Max's birthdays with a, uh, a um, well, box of sand together with a scoop and uh, sieve, sieve and uh, instructions for armchair archaeologists who want to do archaeology without leaving their home. The sand was divided into layers with uh, bits of uh, sheets of cardboard and in the different layers were, were artifacts, old things that I found and somehow uh, old Indian heads and Coke bottle tops and pieces of glass. Well, anyway. 
Um, so, and I presented that to Max as, so we could do archaeology without going out. Okay, and, and there are more and more like this. Uh, there's an elaborate joke about making Jack Pumpkinhead for my, for Nick and Sarah for several Halloweens. I'll tell these in another, uh, another uh, reminiscent talk of, my, of the same kind about my children. So that's all for this one anyway, after this long, long one.